Hello, everybody. I'm Christian Salinas, the Artistic and Executive Director of QFest, the Houston International LGBTQ Film Festival, now in its 25th and sadly final year. I'd like to thank our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Homelight, our longtime sponsor, the John Stephen Kellett Foundation, and of course, our program sponsors, the Hollyfield Foundation and the Houston Arts Alliance. And finally, our media sponsors, Spectrum South and Houston Media Source, who is making this panel possible. We have an esteemed group of wonderful women directors, four of which are from Houston, and one a guest of, of our festival. I shall start with Katie McLean. She's the director of a featured film in this year's festival called Seeing is Believing, Women Direct, she is a three-time Emmy Award winner in three categories and is perhaps best known to many of you out there as Dixie from All My Children. And now I'd like to also introduce our uh, my fellow Houstonians, starting with Michelle Mower, an accomplished writer, director, producer, whose first film was Preacher's Daughter, starring Andrea Bowen and who has a long-term deal with Lifetime. I also like to introduce Jenny Waldo, who I have known for many years from our days at the Southwest Alternate Media Project. Jenny is a film professor, as well as a writer, director, and producer, and her first feature film, The Acid Test, will be premiering at the end of October at two film festivals simultaneously, one of which is the Austin Film Festival. And now for my, my dear friend and um, mother of my child, Stephanie St. Sanchez. Stephanie is a DIY, no budget filmmaker whose aesthetic focuses on the lesbian Latina experience. She is a multi-grant awardee and is the founder of Senorita Cinema a festival dedicated to supporting and exhibiting the work of Latina film, filmmakers across the US and the world. And finally, our wonderful friend and colleague, Mel Peterson, who also is a writer, director and producer and has, uh, has been an, also a recipient of awards here in town. She produced wrote and directed a play called Space Junk, which featured live action drones during the production. So welcome everybody. And now I'd like to start with, uh, with Katie. So I wanted to say, I love your documentary. I think it's an enormous challenge to have as many people as you had in your film to focus on you know, so many different voices and to make it coherent and inspiring. So congratulations on that. That is not easy. It's just not easy. <laughs> That's true. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I feel like, you know, when I saw it, um, you, you accomplish the, the, ch you accomplish the challenge of, of, uh, of capturing so many different perspectives from a variety of women who are at different points in their career with very different experiences. And you allowed each of them to speak very honestly, very openly. There seemed to be this environment where they felt comfortable sharing with you. And I think that really lent to the experience of seeing that film and really appreciating and understanding the challenges that women face in the field of directing. So I wanna ask you as someone who has made it their uh, their goal to become a director. You took directing classes, I believe at AFI among other places. Um, what did you gain from talking to all of these women? What did you walk away with from that experience? Well, um, my goal, I'm gonna just roll back a little bit because um, you really encapsulated so much of my original intention with the film and my original intention with the film was to be able to give um, any filmmaker of any female identifying filmmaker, especially 
of any age, race, you know, color, creed, sexual identification, um, a place where they could find someone who was just a little like them so that it would give them an in to feeling like their voice was important and that their story was needed. Because I found that women's narratives were very limited and especially, um, uh, you know, the amount of, of experiences that women have are very varied. They're wide and varied and they tend to be limited down into like little, little simple lanes. And of course, I know this <laughs> in part um, because of the disparity between my actual life as a woman and my life as an actor um, on soap operas, which back in the day was considered to be the woman's medium. And here is where women's stories can be told. Uh, so I think there's a possibility that my um, sort of visual familiarity and the fact that I've been in show business since I was a kid was a kind of a comfort zone for a lot of the women that I spoke to. And then because I've had so many years in show business, I was able to reach a vast um, array of women. And that was the goal. So if you wanted to make a music video or if you wanted to just make commercials, some people, some women don't wanna make you know, narrative films. That's not their goal to be a great independent filmmaker or even a studio filmmaker. Some just love making you know, shorts or uh, some people do love the independent world. And so I also wanted to give that opportunity um, for them to say, oh, what, what um, field? You know, what particular genre do I want to work in? What, what resonates to me? And so that was sort of like, those are two of just a, or maybe three of the layers that I was approaching the film with um, in terms of weaving together those stories. The other was uh, that I didn't really want to focus on the obstacles. I wanted to focus on how to overcome the obstacles. I wanted to show what really great leadership looks like. And this, these just happen to be women who are leading. So men could also watch the film and go, you know what? I don't like the way that looks. I don't wanna be that kind of leader. I wanna be that kind of leader. And women could also say, we can lead the way in terms of, of, of representing what great leadership looks like. And, in, and a, par, a big part of that is listening, but it's also being very clear about what you want. And I love that about Leslie Linka Gladder, who was, that was her first, um, she was the first person to really talk about that, like know what you want, be able to be clear to and communicate what you want. Um, and I'm very excited as you guys all probably know that she is the, uh, the new um, head of the DGA, uh, which is the president of the DGA, which is so exciting. I was just like, wow, the second woman president ever of the DGA. So that's very exciting. And I'm sure that's going to bring more opportunities for all kinds of women and all kinds of female driven uh, stories and characters. That is a wonderful development. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Um, that is wonderful. She was, um, she was, she was certainly um, she, what I loved about her was she was very unafraid and, um, just really took on the challenges. She didn't shy away. I, I really agree with you that she is a guiding light for other women and not just women for men who want to get in the industry. She really is. She's quite somebody I like, yeah. I really loved her. Um, you know, one thing I see happen, you know, certainly working in a, um, in a gay and lesbian film festival is that directors oftentimes can be, um, I guess, cast type or typecast, if you will, into directing only certain kinds of uh, projects. Gay directors, especially if they're not white men, will often be assigned gay projects. Um, and that seems to be the case, I think, for women directors across the board. Um, perhaps Katie and Michelle, you probably can speak most directly to this. Have you felt that there were uh, at times that you were being um, limited in what you could direct? And Stephanie, you too, like being a, a Latina, did you ever feel like, 
you know, that's all people saw you as and that you may not have a broader voice. Do you feel those limitations ever being placed upon you? Well, um, I'll just start off and and very quickly, and then um, I'd love to hear what um, Stephanie and Michelle have to say on this as well. Um, And I also just want to say I'm just so honored and pleased to be on such a fantastic panel with uh, you all and Jenny and Um, you're just such, um, really impressive, uh, filmmakers and women with incredible careers and, and visions. And, uh, so I, I'm looking forward to listening to you and and hearing and learning from you. So, um, just want to say that. And, um, in terms of being limited, I mean, I feel like, (laughs) you know, in, in growing up as an actor, uh, and it's, it's, I've always been told what I can't do. <laughs> I've always been told this is where you fit and this is what you can't do. And so um, I think it's just really been my own determination to sort of say like, uh, you know, I'm just going to ignore that. I'm just going to ignore that. And I'm going to drive forward what my vision is for this story or what story it is I want to tell. Because when I try to make myself fit what they, they, you know, or what, some, you know, person or organization wants me to be, I'm very unhappy. (laughs) You know, I just find myself, I just, and that now I'm old enough that I'm just like, I just can't do it. I just, I'm sorry. I just can't, I can't do it. It's just not my jam, man. It's just no spark is going off. I got no love for that, you know, but I do have love for this, you know, and I think that's part of, you know, what I try to do with other women is, try to, to, to validate their spark and say, you are, that spark is everything and you are allowed to have it. And I cannot wait to see what you do with it and just bring it on, you know, because we need you, we need that unique voice and that spark that comes directly from you. I, I agree. I mean, I feel like, um, for me, uh, you know, I, my first film sort of uh, set the stage, I, I, uh, if you will, for, you know, how my career would, um, unfold over the next now 11 years, uh, wherein we made an indie film that was sold to Lifetime. Uh, we made, we made the film in 2010, but it was sold to Lifetime in 2012 and ended up being the highest rated movie on the network for the entire year and launched an entire franchise of movies and a reality show. <laughs> so, so that was uh, not very many people could say they created a franchise on a network. Uh, but, but at the same time, it did, you know, somewhat put me into, um, you know, sort of a niche that, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, I've been very grateful for, you know, that I have that work and that I have those connections. I will clarify, I don't actually have a deal with Lifetime. Um, I, I just have a good relationship with them that if I bring a project to them, then they, you know, they look at it, you know, they want to see what I'm doing and, and they support me as a filmmaker and they support my, my, and a screen as a screenwriter and as a director. And, um, you know, and I'm really fortunate that I've been able to build that relationship and, uh, it's, you know, they're a really great company to work for, um, and, uh, to work with. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I'm also a, you know, an indie filmmaker. I make films, you know, like, uh, in 2018, I shot an indie film called The Never List, which was not on Lifetime. It was, uh, theatrically released back in December, uh, right in the height of covid <laughs> and all of that. So, you know, it wasn't the ideal timing, but, uh, certainly in my, in my, um, when I was growing up dreaming about being a, a movie director, having my movie released, uh, in the middle of a pandemic was not part of the, uh, dream, you know, but it happened. And, and I was very grateful that, you know, that I was able to even get the film released in that many theaters at all, frankly. And, um, and then now of course it's on VOD, and it's a film I'm very proud of. And uh, and so I, I want to be able to make more varying types of films, you know, and not just be sort of, you know, put in a box as a filmmaker. And, uh, but I will say it's it's easier to get projects greenlit that are, you know, for, you know, uh, you know, commercial, that are commercial and for a specific network than it is uh, trying to get uh, a film greenlit that's, you know, no distribution attached. It's, you know, it's an indie film, that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, but that doesn't mean I don't keep trying, <laughs> you know, I always keep trying, uh, to, uh, to get those, those stories told. Right. And, um, 
And, uh, you know, I, I've just been really, really blessed. You know, my whole, my whole, the last, uh, even before I went into making movies full time, you know, being able to work uh, here in Houston uh, and being such a, a integral part of the, the film community in Houston and in Texas and uh, building a lot of really incredible relationships. It's interesting because when I grew up uh, in Texas, here in Houston, there was very few, not just women filmmakers, but just filmmakers in general <laughs> to, to, you know, look up to and say, oh, look what they're doing. I can do the same thing, you know, and, and, uh, you know, when I grew up, you know, we, I had to go to the library to, to learn about screenwriting and I had to go to the, you know, uh, cinema to learn filmmaking, you know, I, there was just n not a whole lot of opportunities and being able to sort of help be a part of changing that dynamic in Houston where more people who were interested in learning the, the craft of telling stories through this medium had opportunities that I didn't have growing up. And through my work with Swamp, uh, Southwest Alternate Media Project, I was able to do that for eight years. And um, and then eventually segued into my own, um, you know, career as a filmmaker. So, uh, so you know, I've been very, very blessed uh, to, to have the success that I've had. And, um, and I'm, you know, really excited to, you know, get this next movie started that we start on Wednesday. And I just like, Ah, it's been kind of a crazy, my first movie to do during uh, the pandemic. And it's been, uh, it's been rough. I'm not going to lie, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's the, you know, this is how it is. You know, we got to keep forging ahead, right? Keep forging ahead and getting those stories told. So yay, let's make a movie. I support you, Michelle. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Thank you, Mel. I love, love you. <laughs> um, for myself, uh, I, I will say this as, as a as a DIY filmmaker that um, I'm very my 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 aesthetic is lo-fi and and retro and um, I have the um, and badass. Oh, well, thank you so much. I have the uh, I have the pleasure of doing whatever the fuck I want, um, and that's really nice. So having the um, I don't really have to, uh, you know, I, I doubt that my phone would ring anyway for a, a, a Adam Sandler project or anything of that nature because I'm not really on anybody's radar very much. Um, so I, and so being, I guess, if you want to say pigeonholed or, or if I'm going to be stuck telling uh, stories about Latinas, I'm okay with that. I really like doing it. I'm really happy here. Um, and there's still so many stories. You know, um, that's why I do the Senorita Cinema as what, what Katie, we were, we were talking about um, having the, the festival experience is that you are around people that understand your your triumphs and your struggles. I mean, uh, female filmmakers, um, the same thing happened um, with uh, with Latina filmmakers uh, is, is almost like with female filmmakers is that uh, a lot of the times when you're in the room with your male contemporaries, they're surprised that you know how to talk shop. And you have to fight for, you know, your place at the table. Um, but when you're around women filmmakers uh, or Latina filmmakers, um, there's plenty of room and there's plenty of food. <laughs> and, there's, and there's plenty of, uh, of talk and um, support, I think. Um, and there's room for everyone, I think, with that. So, so that said, I think that um, there's plenty of stories out there. And it's just wonderful to be able to have that that support of a community that is, uh, I say this a lot, the Tusavis moment. You know, when you see that, when you recognize that person you're talking to about film, that they have the same uh, love and experience uh, in their own way uh, to carry that torch, the authentic, the authentic feelings, you know. Um, it's, it's sort of a, there's a career path of, you know, a lot of it's luck, um, definitely it's craft and talent for sure. Um, but you just you keep plugging away. You have to. So. Got a million of them. Just give me a chance, you know. <laughs> it's interesting because when I was, uh, you know, up and coming filmmaker, there were so few women directors to really look up to and, and sort of like, you know, follow their path, you know, and even, you know, there's just so few. And now there's so there's a lot more, mostly in the TV episodic space. And a lot of these filmmakers are our friends, you know, people that I know personally who I could always, you know, 
hey, let's have lunch and talk shop or, you know, let's just hang out and not talk shop, you know, <laughs> grab drinks, you know? So, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, you know, I see things improving slowly, uh, but, uh, but there's certainly a lot more, you know, there's a lot of room for, for um, more women to uh, make their mark, uh, especially behind the camera. So I, you know, I feel like it's so important that this documentary that uh, Katie made is, you know, really helps. It's actually one of the few document documentaries on the subject that was directed by a woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so ironically incredible. You know, What's that? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I was like, I think it's just two. It's just two. I think so. I think so. So it's a little ironic, but at the same time, very indicative of kind of like what's been happening. You know, it's like, yay, yay, rah, rah, women. And, uh, you know, but it's still men driving the narrative. And, and, uh, and uh, the more women we get behind the camera, I, I, to this day, I have, I mean, I just had lunch with an actress that we're, I'm working with on this next movie. And she said, you know, like I'm the second female director she's ever worked with. I mean, still after 11 years of doing this and with all the, the, the um, progress that I think women have made behind the camera, especially in the last several years, it's still, you know, like getting those invariably when I make a film, I get that comment, like you're the first or the second or the third female director. Like it's just, it's notable. And I'm looking forward to the day where it's not even mentioned you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like when I first started out, uh, which at this point is now over 20 years ago, I, I had an internship when I was in college on the Paramount lot and, um, and then, you know, ended up going to USC for, for film school. And when I came out there, I really hated the term female filmmaker or, or women's film, you know, and, and the women's film, I mean, as much as i love and respect Jane Campion and, you know, and all, and Agnes Varda and, you know, all these amazing women. There, there are so many of what was quote unquote women's films that I would go and watch and be like, this does not represent my experience in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I was always a tomboy and I was like, I, you know, I want to be the next Quentin Tarantino like that, you know, and then there's also to a certain degree, a certain amount of unpacking of my own kind of um, uh, culture, you know, like the, the things that the subliminal stuff that you just kind of regurgitate, you know, and, Mm -hmm. um, and it really wasn't until I left LA and was pregnant with my first child where I started really realizing the ceiling that I was kind of hitting, you know, and I was kind of like, well, I can't really get production work right now because I'm pregnant and nobody's going to want to hire me to be on set. Um, and, and I can certainly do my own stuff. And I, I mean, I shot, um, I mean, I shot while, uh, you know, carrying a, a year old child, nursing a year old child and pregnant. And I shot a documentary during that time, you know, and uh, with my kids strapped to my back. So, I mean, I know it's possible, but, uh, and I know it's ridiculous. And that, that just kind of that experience of kind of hitting this moment as a woman, you know, or in my kind of female body that I hadn't really experienced before because I was much more kind of masculine, you know, kind of, you know, aggressive type. I liked being the only girl in the room, you know, like to me, I had more guy friends than girl, you know, it was just like, I felt comfortable in those spaces. And so I didn't quite see that I was actually perpetuating to a certain extent, some of the sexism, you know, and uh, because, you know, I didn't want to talk about makeup or purses or shoes. Like, I mean, like who wants to talk about that? Like, not me, you know, and and right. And I mean, there are other people that do like my husband has a, has a, a friend and they were, a colleague and like every time we get together she just loves Sephora and is constantly talking about it and I'm like I need to get out of the room right now you know like (laughs) I need somebody else and I just and I'm trying like I'm trying you know but it it just was really uncomfortable I was so uncomfortable with my femininity as a child and that was you know part of you know being a riot girl and fighting the patriarchy in the 90s and all that stuff but it's 
it was really that once I kind of hit that milestone as a, as a woman that I started really unpacking some of the stuff that I was carrying with me kind of culturally. And I mean, luckily kind of, and Joanna Kern says this in the, in the movie, like luckily my dad was just like, you can be whatever you want to be. So, I mean, I really thought I could be whatever I wanted to be. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, wait a minute. (laughs) I can't like I mean not that I can't but it's just it's certainly not as easy as I thought it was gonna be and just just because I how of how I present you know of of how I walk into the room and um and so it's it's been really interesting because in the last few years I have taken on that kind of moniker of being a female filmmaker like I've chosen it as a political statement Um, And like Michelle was saying, I hope one day, because I agree, it shouldn't matter. And I, you know, it's just about different perspectives and what you bring to the table. And, and I think some of the things wrapped up in some of these discussions, it perpetuates kind of a toxic masculinity, which doesn't need to exist anymore either. Um, But it it just, until that day comes, you know, I'm going to stand by this female filmmaker and I'm going to make the films that I want to make and they're going to be you know my kind of female films and hopefully other people will like them too (laughs) well you know Jenny you touched on something that um I wanted to um ask 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 those who have children and don't worry Mel I have a question for you specifically but um um I didn't realize that you um, I didn't realize that you were shooting that film with your child strapped to your back. I had no idea, but I don't think I knew you as well back then. But wow. Oh, this was back. Yeah, I was shooting. This was early in my days, kind of early pre-swamp when I first got here. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was doing a a documentary for, because my background is actually in documentary. Mm -hmm. And and I was working with a a group headed by midwives that were kind of educating women about pregnancy. And, you know, it didn't have to be natural birth, but it was kind of all, a lot of the people were kind of into the natural birth scene. And, um, And they were looking for volunteers. They do this event every year and I was like look you know I could volunteer but I can also film and give you an outreach you know piece of of promotional material and so so yeah I was pregnant my kid was like 15 months old and I um was still nursing him (laughs) and uh yeah I just shot this I went around this event with a camera and shot interviews and um and put it together but that that was yeah that was a while ago and then I also did another one for this mon- I did a series for this Montessori group of again kind of promotional stuff and I was nursing my then second child at the time and so I would hire a babysitter to watch her on site when I would film the different classrooms and then I would go she'd kind of like wave in the window and I'd go and nurse and then because none of my kids ever took a bottle and I was terrible at pumping so it was just (laughs) I I mean it was it was I it just didn't work for me any other way so hey Jenny I uh, just wanted to make a comment because you were talking about how you said um you know you couldn't really pursue you know working on a production because you were pregnant and then you know you just sort of like fit your production around the like you know your the mother you know, uh, aspect of your life. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, when you made acid test, wasn't your director of ph- photography pregnant? She was, she got pregnant after. Oh, was uh-huh. it after? Yeah. Was yeah, pregnant yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. She got pregnant. Yeah. We've got two production babies off of our, off of our film. <laughs> but yeah yeah and I've had like I've had instances where I had a PA on the short that you produced about the two sisters one of my friends who was helping when she was signing her emergency medical waiver she she, not waiver but form she came up to me or I looked at it and it said that she was pregnant I was like (gasps) what you know and she was like it's early but I just figured in case something happens I was like oh that's great you know and so it wasn't a problem to have her on set but it's just you know again, it's just one of those things where it's a reality that I think 
it's much easier when you're dealing with women filmmakers to kind of have these conversations. Well, my philosophy um, is when I was pregnant with my oldest, I was five months pregnant and we had already, you know, planned this like ski vacation. And I asked my, my doctor, I'm like, well, can I still ski? And he's like, do you know how to ski? And I'm like, well, yeah. I ski. And he's like, well, if you know how to ski, then you should be able to ski even if you're five months pregnant. So if I can ski at five months pregnant, I can produce. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, I have a, a quick insert with yeah. the pregnancy thing <laughs> where I'm going to. I, not personally, but um, Stephanie, yeah. who was involved in my drone project, the play, we found out her wife was pregnant during the pr production. And so I always like to be like, well, I helped them conceive <laughs> You never know. Parties, great events, you know, that creative stimulus just kickstarts out. <laughs> that was Thank our you, first Mom. kid. Yeah, Thank exactly. you, Mom. I like to advertise you, girl. <laughs> and the other story I heard, which was actually on, um, we were talking about public access TV. This was a documentary about women in history. Um, narrated by Lucy Lawless, who played the fabulous Xena Warrior Princess. Uh, I'm a total nerd. And, okay. <laughs> and uh, it was about women warriors. And they had one episode about Bodicea, who apparently was giving birth to her child on a ship at the same time that it was being attacked by British soldiers. So she actually paused her pregnancy or birth to go up on deck, fight the soldiers, win, and then go back down and have her kids. So, you know, what women can do. <laughs> it's impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. But I mean, in a funny way, even a, a, to, to look at this question as like, uh, is a pregnancy an obstacle or, or how do you overcome, you know, or deal with a pregnancy uh, brings brings into consideration the importance of women in other positions other than directing the hiring positions the producing positions um you know uh and as well as how important the the narrative in the writing is in in terms of showing a, a perspective within a story the, a woman that has wants to make up her own mind that is not going to quit her job because she's pregnant you know that is not even a consideration or nor are the people around her even thinking that she should. I mean, this is the change that we can also propel forward in our world by adjusting the narratives that we tell in the world, whether they're commercial and especially the commercial narratives, I think, which I'm starting to really notice that in the more commercial narratives. And I think that's really exciting. Um, so that this is, this isn't even going to be a question, you know, can you do your job and be pregnant at the same time? It's, Right. It will be, be belonging to another age and another time. But I do think that we have to, that's part of the continual encouragement of the, the female voice or the female leader or the feminine mindset, if even if you will, um, that it, in, it, that is inclusive of the birth giving experience in terms of our, it is inclusive into our lives and woven into every aspect of, you know, work and creativity um, and not sort of cordoned off to the side as something that is, you know, a woman's experience that she has to have outside of a working life. Stephanie, do you want to contribute anything? I mean, you are raising two children. I uh, am. Um, yeah, just really, just really quickly. And um, it is interesting to see how it is changing a bit, truly. Um, so as you know, that I, I run the Senorita Cinema Film Festival, and that's a Latina film festival. And... Um, I've been doing that for a while. And what I've noticed is that a lot of the female, I mean, a lot of the Latina filmmakers, they'll come out real strong with their first film. And cause they have, you know, the vim and the vigor and the, and the drive and, and everything. Um, but then you don't hear from them anymore. And it's because they started a family. And uh, this is a traditional um, a, a Latina tradition is that, you know, once you start, once you have children, you, you take that supporting role for your man and you, you, you raise your kids. And I mean, your adventures are over for a while, you know, and uh, not until your kids are a certain age, do you, are you able to get back out there? Um, you know, and then you find these women uh, fighting for relevancy because, you know, now they're not in their twenties anymore. And so their voices, you know, have changed and they're different. Um, 
And so I've been seeing that happen now. I've been uh, doing this long enough that I've seen women who have had children and disappeared and that are now coming back. And, you know, and it's it's really nice because if you have the heart of an artist and you, you know, what is it? Uh, you, you don't pick the thug life, the thug life picks you, that kind of thing. <laughs> you, you, will, you will come back, you know? Yeah. And, um, but because and it, it's overwhelming to have children. It really is. It's a, it's a tough, tough job. Mm-hmm. And uh, especially I'm finding that out this year, having two now, mm-hmm. um, is that it's hard to keep up with uh, all the things you used to be able to keep up with. Now your, your, your priorities are different. It's not necessarily forced, but, you know, you choose to do this thing as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so luckily, those women that have uh, that gone away and they're coming back, they're going to be able to pick up the slack for me for this uh, next round of Senorita Cinema. So I think that that having something like that in place, you know, a uh, community like that, like, okay, you take this time, I'll, I'll take this time, and we'll be back together in the middle and keep this going. Uh, it's interesting to see how that's developing right now. But I think that's unique uh, to women because we're the ones that have the kids. But that is also a great director's job is delegating out responsibilities, you know, knowing what needs to be done and delegating it out. And, um, you know, it sounds like, I mean, I don't have kids. Unfortunately, I can't have kids. Um, and then I chose to not adopt um, because I didn't want to adopt as a, be a single mom adopting. And of course, the kids that I want to adopt are 16 years old. So <laughs> <laughs> I ended up working for um, or with the, the kids in the spotlight, which is maybe something I uh, you wouldn't mind my mentioning. It's a really great uh, filmmaking program for um, and with uh, foster kids here in Los Angeles. So we bring in filmmakers and I want you all to know about it because they're always looking for more female filmmakers to come in and make a one day movie with, uh, with these foster youth. And it's really, it's one of the greatest things I get to do um, every year. I've done three in a row and it's just really, really special to take that ability as a filmmaker and then work with these youth who are just so desperate to tell their story or be a part of something or see maybe if this is a community that, that they grew up in here in Los Angeles that they can be a part of and possibly make a living, whether they're a crew member or a writer. Um, or maybe even a director, who knows, you know, it's pretty special. So that's just another, another aspect. If you don't have kids as a way to loop them into your, your filmmaking life. Uh, Yeah. Please don't hesitate to share that on our social media. That's wonderful. I will. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fantastic thing. And actually that was going to cover one of the things I was going to mention too, with public access and stuff. One of my jobs here you know, in between being my own filmmaker is I, I work on the equipment desk and our public access station, you can join to learn how to be a filmmaker. So we teach you how to use the equipment. We teach you how to edit. We t- And you have a ready-made distribution outlet because we're a TV station and we're the community voice. So it's like once you get content, put it out there, start. And it doesn't matter what stage you start at. It doesn't matter that you didn't know how to press the on button when you came in. (laughs) You will eventually learn this and slowly your programs, your content will improve. And, you know, generally we always hope that, hey, at, you know, at a certain point, you're going to move beyond us and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be a narrative filmmaker out in Hollywood or you're going to be, you know, move countries or you're going to be doing TV or whatnot. But I love that aspect of my job. Like, I I really enjoy public access because, to me, that's the community's voice. And you get young people, you get older people, uh, people from all walks of life and all communities. And it's such an amazing feeling. I kind of equate it to, like, you know, going back to the dawn of time where it's like you're there trying to survive And then you're trying to make a fire to cook meal to like, you know, develop as a as a species. And then someone hands you a cooking utensil and suddenly someone's handed you that tool that has given you life. And to me, filmmaking is like that, too. You hand a camera and and tools for people to create their own story, to tell their own narrative. And everybody has a story. Everyone's a director, really, Mm -hmm. you know. But if you hand them that resource, they now have a tool to live that life, 
you know, Mm -hmm. to thrive. And I just, I love that aspect. I love that you are contributing to kids being able to get into that field and being able to get a a filmmaking life, a voice as well as, you know, a a way of living. (laughs) Totally, totally. Stephanie, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, have you thought about maybe uh, as your kids get older, uh, looping them into the the business? Are they going to be carrying gear? And <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she's already Managing made her crafty. premiere. Oh, yeah, she? oh she's, yeah, she's already, yeah. The first one is already, she's like, are you going to the studio today, mom? You know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. That's so I want to go, I want to go. Yeah, and as um, we filmed together as a baby, she brought the script into the room to hand her mother. <laughs> wow. <laughs> For her scene. <laughs> Wow. An innate understanding of directing. And mm. um, I told Stephanie, I said, she and I are going to make films together, but first, probably direct fashion runway shows in Italy. Oh. <laughs> That's our goal. So great. Yeah. Great. The, the, hopefully, they don't turn out like both my boys are. Uh, are, I, you know, I took them to sets whenever they were growing up and they literally thought like movie sets were the most boring places on the planet. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so Same. neither of them Same. went into the film business. My oldest is a, is a financial analyst and my youngest is a, a senior studying mechan- uh, college in college studying mechanical engineering. So they went into very practical, you know, career paths, but, uh, which I'm super proud of. And I think it's awesome. Uh, but you know, I'm sure that them coming to film sets and, you know, watching, watching me, you know, do take after take after take after take was like, you know, Oh, this is so boring. (laughs) Well, that is, that is true. I often also say to people like, you really have to love your work to be in the art industry Mm. and to be a filmmaker (laughs) because it is not easy it's like you know it's it is standing in line constantly waiting for your turn and then hurry up and go when you got your opportunity and your opportunity always comes at the same time that a billion other things you're doing at this at once Mm. so yeah. yeah I think it was uh it was um Vanessa Redgrave, who was like telling her daughter and like, you know, only go in this business if you literally cannot see yourself doing anything else. Like, cause it's so hard and there's so much re- rejection, especially if you're an actor, but, but even when you're not an actor, even if you're a filmmaker, I mean, it's just so much rejection and so much, um, you know, just hustle trying to get things going and flowing and moving and, and, you know, tr- get some traction going with projects. It's just a, it's a lot of work. And, and then once you do, even when you do get green lit, it's a, you know, ins- insane amount of work. And uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's really, it's not easy. And mm-hmm. I think that, uh, you know, that, that a lot of filmmakers, I mean, a lot of people growing up think they want to be whatever they think in their mind is the idea of being a filmmaker. And, to, and then when they actually do it, they're like, oh, wow, this is not what I had, <laughs> you know, I was mm-hmm. expecting it to be. It's actually a lot of work. And that's when you, you know, you have to make the decision, you know, is this, do you love it enough? Is this your passion? And is this something you just can't see yourself not, not doing no matter how hard it is. And if the answer is yes, then keep going, you know, you know, keep being persistent with it. Um, Otherwise there are many, many other careers out there that are fulfilling that will, (laughs) you know, that are even creative that, that you can pursue that, that aren't nearly as hard. Mm-hmm. And difficult to get the funding and difficult to get the distribution and get difficult at every sort of stage of the process. So, so, um, you know, I encourage people to, you know, to go out there and make some shorts and see if this is truly what they are just in, passionate about and just mm-hmm. can't do anything else. And if it, if it is, then, you know, keep striving for that, you know, to get that feature made and get, um, you know, get, get their, you know, those stories told. I want to, um, I know we're, we're getting close to our, our cutoff point, but um, all of you, especially you, Katie, have, have brought up the, um, the issue of access. And um, <clears throat> so one thing I failed to mention when we started this panel was that <clears throat> several years ago, I think it was in, I want to say 2012 or something like that, we had changed the 
we had changed the way that we selected films for this festival and we decided to go exclusively film freeway just to kind of open it up to more people and um, to just break away from the distributors. Not that there was anything wrong with them, but it was just, I felt like we needed more voices and we were not necessarily getting that by just going through the usual channels that we had been using for, you know, years and years prior. And as a result of having done that, we had actually achieved a point, and Stephanie, help me remember this. Um, I think it was almost 50% women directors that year, wasn't it? It wasn't over, but it was, it was the closest we had ever gotten to where the films directed by women were almost equal to what was directed by men. And yeah. this has kind of, kind of been a goal of mine because I felt like we're a queer festival. There, there are more women making films, but you know, somehow we're missing that. And again, cause a lot of distributors back then were still focused on men and men had access to the money and therefore the production quality and um, the mentorship, especially it was the mentorship. So, what I didn't mention when we started was that this year, out of 52 films, right, Steph? Yeah, 52. <clears throat> out of 52 films, we have 28 directed by a woman. Yeah. That's great. Totally. Yeah. In our final festival, by chance, we actually finally achieved that goal and surpassed it. Mm -hmm. And I am very happy that we have been able to do that. But I will say that when I look at these at the films now, there has been such a um, a transformation. But this is not necessarily happening here. It's happening in Europe, where you're seeing more opportunities for women. The funding is is in place. Mm -hmm. Clearly, there's mentorship going on somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that we need to still work on in our own country, mm -hmm. um, because we don't have very many films from the U S yours is one of the few Katie mm. that we're showing that's American made. Mm. Um, but I wanted to say something about access because this also relates to your film and something I loved about your, your documentary. When we talk about access, it is important for each of us, especially those of us who are minorities mm. to recognize that we're not just here to support our own, <clears throat> that we have to broaden the support because as a as a whole that's how we advance each other and and support each other so i always give the example of when i was working for an ad agency here in houston that for a brief moment we were all minority and it was not by design it was just how it filtered with people leaving and coming in we were all minorities so when we were looking to hire interns it was the first time I was in a room where we discussed interns in a way where we were acknowledging who needs this opportunity more than the other person. Not about who are their parents, what is the parent's background, does their parent, does one of their parents work at Fox in publicity or, you know, oh, their father's a producer, we need to hire, you know, it wasn't looking at who had the privileged background. We were actually looking at, okay, this person is going to school in publicity and marketing, they're working at Taco Bell. They need this opportunity because anybody who is working at Taco Bell already knows customer service. That's the, one of the hardest jobs you can have is working fast food. We as minorities understood that there is a, a greater difficulty for people who are having to work and go to school. And by the way, working jobs that don't pay well, these are the people who need these opportunities. So when I look at, you know, Jenny Waldo, she hired a cast of mostly, if not all women for her feature. Mm -hmm. Stephanie works with a lot of other Latinos, male and female, you know, on her films, but mostly female. Michelle, you've also been very focused on supporting um, minorities and women in the filmmaking process. Um, is there, and your film, again, like you are dealing with straight women, women of color, lesbians, so you're interviewing all of them. You are showing this community of women. And that's what I wanted to reflect in this panel was a community of women, how 
you know, because I've gotten support from each of you at different points in my own career. So it's like we all help each other. We we are a very fortunate um, community. With we, we have our struggles, of course. You know, being a sitting far removed from the industry, but here we are. Like we're still doing this. Um, maybe it's more of an observation. So I apologize. I might not have a question attached to that. But uh, is okay, there sure. is okay. there I guess if one of you, if not all of you, if there's something that you can add to the discussion of access where you see um, or where you've you've experienced on your own a way that you have successfully helped people gain access to the field, Michelle. It's a conscious choice. So once you're, you know, in my in my you know, background, you know, I, I was, you know, making a lot of films in Houston and, you know, I would work with crew that, you know, who I knew, you know, and for the most part, it was mostly, you know, I would say more skewed, more men that, but we did have obviously some women uh, working in the films as well, but because we're such a small community, it's like you work with whoever's available, you know, and willing to do it for the rate, you know? So there wasn't really a conscious decision. It was just more like what I needed to do to get the film made. Right. Uh, in 2018, I made a film in LA and where, I mean, just, the, you know, very obviously like huge film community of, of a huge pool of people to hire for every single possible position on a film. And uh, and I remember telling my producer, uh, Anna Albello, uh, who had just come off of a film where they had a, um, you know, a high number of female behind the camera as, as well as a director as, as on. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we had that conversation. I said, I want all female crew, if possible. And she said, well, you know, we're, I'll do my best, but, you know, it may not be all fem female crew, but it'll be majority female crew. And I said, that's great. You know, let's do, do the best you can to, to hire as many female uh, behind the camera as possible. And, um, and we had close to 70% female representation. Um, on that film, we had, uh, I, I want to say, uh, we had a significant LGBT representation on on camera and behind the camera. Um, and uh, and we had, um, you know, just it was a really, I mean, one of the best crews I ever worked with. I mean, hands down. I mean, it, it, they really did a phenomenal job and were very professional. And, and uh, I, I you know, I'd like to say I didn't see a difference between the crews, but I actually did see a difference. I saw, you know, uh, I saw, you know, all of these people showing up to work, ready to, you know, to do the job, excited to be there uh, and and got to work with some really incredible people. And, and that was a conscious decision. You know, that wasn't just like, you know, oh, hey, we'll hire whoever's available and willing to do the right scenario. It was like, I want I want to do it. I, there have been other filmmakers, female filmmakers who had done it um, and uh, who had made films with all female crew. And I said, let's do it. Let's try it. And, um, and so as someone who is also producing and, and getting the, the money together, the financing together, that's, that's something that we have to, um, you know, we have to really focus on is, is that gender parity, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, making sure that you're, you know, the, the story, if you're, if you're trying to tell stories for women or for the LGBT community, that your, that your crew reflects that story, the people that the stories, the audience you're trying to, to tell that story for, right? I mean, it just makes sense. And, um, but even if it's not, even if it's a story about a straight white dude, still hire people, you know, because, because we've seen straight white dudes tell their own stories for decades now. It's time to get some uh, varying you know, perspectives on, on that, um, you know, to tell some of those stories. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm here for it. I'm excited. And I think, that, I think that the more that we as storytellers, you know, make that effort to that conscious decision to diversify uh, not just the stories that we're telling and the characters that we're including in those stories, but also who we collaborate with behind, you know, to make those stories, um, the better the stories are going to be. That's just, in my experience, that's just how it's, how it is, how it will be. And, uh, and I, you know, I, you know, I, 
I've been really blessed that I've been able to, to have that kind of uh, decision making on some of these films. Yeah, I think it's really important to make that conscious choice, as you know, Michelle was saying. And, you know, we've I've been watching the Instagram uh, IATSE stories, you know, from with the union strike going on. And and I've seen a number of indie producers posting saying, you know, on an indie film, even though you would think because you have less money, you would have less control. It's actually the opposite. And, and in a way, you kind of have a duty to walk the walk when you're at that level, because people are already sacrificing to take a lower pay and, you know, and it's a passion project and all that stuff. So you've got to make sure that you have reasonable work hours, you feed people well, you treat people with respect. Um, and it's, and it's interesting because I, I, I don't, really know why it certainly wasn't a conversation but you know almost 20 years ago when I was at USC I mean pretty much every single film that I've ever done has had some kind of sex scene in it and I remember just even as a student you know doing projects with sex scenes and just being really adamant about the respect and about the clothes set and about communication and about all these things that now you know, people are talking about with intimacy coordinators and all that stuff. And it was just something that I was like, not on my watch. This is not going to happen. You know, we are going to approach this with, uh, you know, our big girl panties on and we're going to talk about sex, even though nobody likes, you know, it's what makes us all uncomfortable. We're going to, we're going to get through this. And, um, and so it's really interesting to me to see, how you know certain things have have changed and and developed and and come into the atmosphere i think what michael k williams you know rest his soul before he died uh, was talking about the trauma um trauma counselors on set of uh of um i'm blanking on the name of the show um but uh so wire. yeah it on wire what? wire no 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 wire. the show he was just on they had oh, trauma the counselors on um what the oh okay it was the hbo show the sci-fi uh movie um it was really beautiful anyways um so i I just think that there's having that a diverse crew a diverse background it it just does happen to like in most cities it, it fosters more understanding and communication and and friendship and bonds and all of that stuff and it's interesting because on acid test, initially, I was kind of going into it from that, um, I think they call it like a debt mentality where it's like, oh, whoever, whoever can work on it, it you know, I'll take, like, I'll just, I'll take whoever it is. Um, and, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and I initially was in talks with a different DP um, who was, who was male. And we had, I mean, we had a phenomenal, you know, great conversations about everything. I mean, I thought it was going to be a great fit, but as it got kind of closer and closer, he got nervous and, and basically we parted ways. And, and it was interesting because I had always wanted Kay to be the DP and there was some miscommunication early on, but I had worked with, I mean, some of my closest female friends from, you know, my LA days are female cinematographers. And so, and we had always worked together and, and I just always liked that relationship. And so I, you know, kind of called Kay again and was like, you know, can you do this? You know, uh, is this, is, and she was like, yeah, let's go. You know, and it was just, we had very little time to prep but it was just such an amazing experience. And, and our cast and our crew was, was well over 70% women and, and people of color. And, um, and there were other things where we're kind of through that. I started being like, Oh, okay, it is a choice. And so when I went into post-production, I was like, I want to find a woman sound designer. And because I'm a Texas filmmaker, I want them to be in Texas, you know, and it was really, it was hard to find somebody. I mean, we did, but it was hard, you know? And so I, it it just kind of became that self-perpetuating. Like you just, you have to ask, you have to push for it. You have to um, make it work and find a way to make it work because 
it without it, you're just perpetuating the same cycle that it's always been and, and change isn't going to happen. So. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really exciting though, that you, you made the effort and that you dug. And I think that's what, um, I mean, if we leave anything with, it's that uh, not only the responsibility, but the power that every filmmaker has every, you know, uh, producer uh, has to, to make that conscious choice to look for people who are dying for that break, who are ready for that access and to give them that chance. Um, it's, and it's also a thrill. I mean, just from my own experience, it is such, I gave um, a young man, a diverse man. Um, I, I think he's Filipino and um, uh, he, his chance to DP a, a short that I did. And um, he was just been so grateful and so excited. And he worked so hard and he did a great job. And I was so proud to be able to give that, you know, opportunity to him. And it was just a quiet thing. You know, we didn't like put it on a billboard or like make a social media post about it. It was between him and me. We knew we didn't tell the crew. It was just us. And, um, you know, and I feel like I've got a friend for life now, you know, he's like, uh, so excited and so ready. And he has something to show now that he can say like, I made this and this was my shot. And, you know, that's my name on that. And so I really, I really, I, I recommend it not only for the importance that, you know, for our community, for our society, um, for the filmmaking world, for the future, um, but just for the, you, for a person, an individual person, for your own personal joy, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I highly recommend it. So I think it's great that you brought it up and, um, and, I, I will say just for myself, for my own um, crews, I actually like a really mixed, uh, and I like a 50-50 male-female group just for me um, because uh, wh whatever their sexual identification is, I feel like there's no um, no one side that's sort of like in, you know, saying like, this is our story or we're going to take over. Or, although, so, I mean, being on an all-female crew must be freaking amazing. <laughs> Just as a woman, I'd be like, I'd like to have that experience. That sounds pretty great. Um, but, but the 50-50 crew also, somehow or other now, there's none of those topics are on the table and we're all just making the movie. Like, that's also just something that I've, I've experienced and that I like that like, okay, you know, everybody's different. Everybody comes from somewhere else. What's the story that we're all getting behind? So um, I've also liked that as that as as an option to think of is when you're when you're you have that opportunity to choose your crew as a way to proceed. And I think it also trans it also is important to you know when you're casting, um, you know for casting because you know we had uh, on the Never List you know we had our lead actress uh, and her uh, mother were um, were uh, Asian American. And, uh, and that was a conscious decision. When I, when I first read the script, the character uh, did not have an ethnicity uh, assigned uh, to her. And uh, I talked to the screenwriter and she was like, absolutely, I would love to see this cat, this character be non-white. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, you know, she left it open for me, the director to sort of in interpret it that and I you know said you know I'm feeling you know I feel like this is a you know we'll, we'll audition a variety of of young actresses from all various backgrounds and ethnicities um but you know I'm personally feeling really strongly like this character you know feels to me like she's Asian American and so we were very focused on trying to uh to cast you know a, a young actress who's uh, from you know with a uh, an Asian American background, and uh, and we were able to do that. Uh, so um, so that was a conscious choice that we made. But then at the same time, like we had, uh, I had a couple of uh, my actors who were uh, mem who are in openly in uh, LGBT, you know, LGBT, um, and uh, one of them I remember before we started filming, an uh, actor, wonderful comedic actor uh, named Drew Drogi. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Drew's work. He's hilarious. Uh, but he and I had a phone call before, you know, I cast him as a principal of this high school. And, uh, and you know, he called me and he's like, you know, 
so do you want him to be gay or do you want to be, you know, we play it straight. I'm like, I just want you to be a principal. <laughs> I, don't care. I don't care what your sexual orientation is. Like he's a principal, just be a principal, you know? And, and, uh, and I think that that's a kind of important too, to normalize, you know, LGBT characters as, as in all types of work and employment and, and, in roles, you know, they don't have to always be, you know, the drag queen or the, you know, the uh, fashion designer or the things that you stereotypically think gay people should be, you know, or gay males should be, or women coaches or whatever, you know, <laughs> soccer coaches, you know, I think you should cast LGBT character uh, actors in everyday roles because we need to, we, we have to see that, that, because that's reality, right? I have friends who are LGBT who have, you know, who are teachers, who are principals, who are, you know, who are, uh, you know, lawyers and accountants and just everyday people. And that's, we, I feel like we need to see more of that on camera too. So, so, uh, you know, just making decisions like in, the, in your casting process, it's going to um, enhance representation, not fall into these tropes that you, you know, that you often see in film and television. So, you know, that's just another sort of side of the, of the coin that, that I feel like, um, that we should, you know, it's a conscious choice, right? I'm going to jump in there too. Uh, cause great points all around. And I, I've been like a proponent of, of like trying, and really it's because of the communities I've fallen in with to doing filmmaking and videography for the trans uh, communities, for uh, non-binary groups and things like that. It opens your mind when you're sitting down and writing a script, you know, if you're a narrative storyteller or even if you're not, you know, sometimes it can open your mind. Just not even writing a gender or not even writing an ethnicity and just thinking of this person as a human being who's going through all these complexities in their life and ha has this thing they need to achieve, you know, as this thing that they maybe consciously they want, but internally the real thing they need is obviously the climax of the film or whatever. But it's been very liberating from a writing perspective to just sit down and think of this, you know, being and start building up their background. Maybe they grew up in, you know, this environment or maybe they come from upper class or lower class or whatever, but don't, don't put every single constriction on them, like slowly build it up and almost like the way they talk now about, uh, don't necessarily assign a gender to your child at birth, you know, do that with scripts. You're birthing characters, you're birthing, you know, r the story. You don't have to have all of that written down in a little codex <laughs> when you first begin because it could be anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the best movies we've had out there, Alien, originally that was going to be a male character, a male lead, and Sigourney mm -hmm. Weaver killed it, and now she's... <laughs> national treasure <laughs> you know it's like and there's other stories like that too like i mentioned xena before they had an episode they dealt with mythologies and the I, mythology of the lost mariner was always a white guy right but they cast tony todd from the Candyman movie as the lost mariner because they said he came in he read and he killed that role so it's like i i love that they were open enough to just see this person come in and and do this role and be like oh no well we gotta hire a white guy or we gotta hire a man or we gotta you know it's like no think about it cast against type because a lot of times when we're thinking like oh this is this type for this role like you mentioned with the lgbt community it's like why you know we're we've thinking that because we've got pre conceived notions of all this thing that was fed to us since we were kids you know, and, and Jenny touched on this too. It's like sometimes even us female filmmakers have to confront our own, you know, internalized misogyny and whatnot to come out to the other side and be like, you know what? No, it's not a bad thing to be a female filmmaker. It's not a bad thing to <laughs> be, to do what, what some people call chick lit or to do super butch stuff. You know, I love in Katie, your documentary, when Lisa's talking about doing 
homeland or doing the action scenes. And it's like, it's not about an explosion for her. It's about the characters. And what does that explosion mean to them? Like, what is it? What's their reaction to that? You know, I mean, it's always inspirational. And when you take away these barriers that we've put ourselves in and really start to see the world and ourselves in this way, it's exciting because you feel like you can recreate yourself, <laughs> you know? So Totally. I think that's such I a great point. I haven't heard from Stephanie in a while. Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah, <laughs> I see some nodding. I see some nodding. I see some head shaking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, listening. I'm just, uh, it's, man, this is such a treat. Just listening to all these points of view, all these points of view. You know, you think how you think all the time, and that's what's all always ruminating in your head, you know, but hearing other people's uh, versions of it, this is great. I'm just, I feel like a fly on the wall just listening to all this. But um, if we are, <clears throat> I, I kind of like, I know that this is, a, you know, it's a round table or a Zoom talk, but I did want to ask Katie a question. Can sure. I roll like that, you guys? Okay. Okay. And this is one of those goofy, you know, um, if you're at, if, if we just finished watching your film and it's a Q&A kind of thing, what did you shoot on? It's not that, it's not that. <laughs> um, but it, but it is like, what was your budget? <laughs> what was your budget? You know, <laughs> oh, I, I noticed, don't answer that. <laughs> yeah, I noticed, um, at the 43 mark that there's a trapper keeper that anyway, whatever, um, oh, yeah. uh, those questions, <laughs> I miss my soul life. Um, but is there anything on, um, that ended, that did not end up in the movie, you know? Because that's the thing when you're doing, especially when you're interviewing so many people and, you know, we all know that filmmakers, they're very shy and they don't like to talk about themselves at all. So it ended up at, you know, is there anything that you had to cut that you're like, ah, you know, I wish we could have had time to, to, to have that in there um, that you'd like to share with us as, uh, you know, insider uh, women directors. Well, I guess uh, to go back to what everyone was talking about in terms of their kids, um, both Trudy Bellinger, who is a top commercial director out of the UK, and Deborah Campmeyer, who is now becoming a very sought after um, episodic director since Ava DuVernay picked her out of a list of female directors who had had their films at Sundance over the years and then just had never been able to break into television. Um, she's now having a wonderful career. Um, and that's really exciting because I've known Deborah for 30 years and, you know, to, to see her get this chance now is so great. But, um, and what, there's so much I could say about them, but they both talked about strapping their kids to their bodies while they were shooting and just wrapping them up. Trudy talked about hiding her pregnancy and then suddenly she just showed up on set one day with a baby and somebody said, whose baby is that? And she says, it's my baby. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought That's was great. just hilarious. And I wish I'd been able to put that in there. Um, but uh, Deborah Kampmeyer is one of the deepest, wisest women and uh, women who can speaking about the female experience. And I mean, on a spiritual level. And I might just re-edit uh, her whole um, interview because, and, and put it out there because it's just so fascinating what she has to say. And I want everybody to, to hear it, you know, talking about um, the importance of your story to like where the female story comes from, talking about, you know, the female mythology and Inanna, goddess Inanna. And I was just like, oh my God, this woman needs her own film. So uh, I guess I wish I, I wish I could share all of that. And I really, every woman had just such vast experience and so much, so much to share. I mean, I wish I'd been able to put in all of Bethany Rooney's um, story. She came, uh, uh, from the Midwest and then ended up as a secretary on St. Elsewhere, worked her way up through production, you know, just grinding, got her first opportunity to direct there. And some of the actors on the set were rough, rough, rough with her and how she persevered and how she learned to kind of take on the strong identity that she needed to have in order to, to direct Hollywood uh, television, which is really quite something. Um, or even Betty Thomas. I mean, my God, what what a story that she told. Um, 
uh, about her life in film and she's funny as hell. And, um, you know, or Lizzie Borden, uh, Lizzie Borden had some stories about, uh, her, uh, one of her, her films that, um, Weinstein, oh my God, I heard Weinstein stories. And, Eek. um, you know, I, I, I did not put the Weinstein story specifically in the film because again, I was not looking to give any of that negative, uh, that negativity, um, any more attention than it deserved. And I knew there was another film that was taking on that and other, uh, you know, that story. And I thought I need to serve this film needs to serve a different purpose. And that purpose is to say, yep, we know that we know that this is, this is, this can be really rough out here. You know, some of these people just shutting down women's careers, just stopping them, which happened. And, um, with both Lizzie Borden and Sarah Karnikan, and they've been very vocal and, and public about that. So I feel okay sharing that. Um, but uh, to say, now look at what these women did despite that. Look how they persevered. Look how they overcame that. Look at the stories, listen to what they wanna say now, because it's so important. You know, it, we have such a tendency to blow up the trauma as being like, oh, this is so newsworthy, you know? fire in the alley, you know, news at 10. <laughs> and I was like, no, the, the panda gave birth is a very important story too. The movie got made, the woman persevered, she did it. And um, she, did not, she did not let him uh, or that, you know, Weinstein was, was not allowed to win. I mean, Sarah Kernikin bought back, took all of her savings and bought back the rights to her film and self-distributed it. Wow. And I know, right? That is some yeah. badass move. She is one impressive lady, you know, wow. multi-Oscar winner for documentaries. And she gets like one line in my movie. <laughs> <laughs> one line. She deserves so much more. Um, so Katie, what I'm hearing is that you need a TV series where you interview uh, female directors, <laughs> maybe on public access. Hey. <laughs> yeah, there are stories to be told, man. Stories to be told. There's so many of them. I thought about, you know, donating the footage to um, museum and film and television, you know, something like that. So in years to come, or at least at the very least the audio footage so that, you know, other future um, generations can like take this, you know, I interviewed over 50 women and um, in, in a full length two hour interviews and um, 70 women and in, including some of the shorter interviews. And, and it's just really, um, you know, ex exciting to have that much material and have that kind of, um, uh, uh, for me, the breadth of experience, but also um, to, to see that each and every one of them, like there was only one of all those women that quit. Only one. Wow. Knowing how hard it is, you know, we all know how many obstacles, how, many, how difficult it is. And even her, I was like meeting with her personally and going like, don't quit. <laughs> She's <laughs> like, honey, I have had it. I am done, I, you know? So, you know, it can, it can, it isn't for everybody, you know, like Michelle said, and sometimes it does, it does, can get to you and you've just had enough. But um, I think uh, who it's for, it is very much for, and the, they deserve, you know, all the, all the love and support that is, it can be given to them. Wow. I think that's a, that's a great place to, uh, to conclude. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, it's moments like this that, you know, moments like this that have made this festival magical through the, through the last 25 years. You know, we're not a big festival. We've been volunteer run for most of, the, of that time, um, but we've always managed to find people like you, artists like you who really have something to give back to the community. So I can't thank you enough for reworking your schedule, for tolerating my tardiness. <laughs> <laughs> See, it wasn't the woman who was late. <laughs> <laughs> so just being a part of all of this, I, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, and and I hope we also made an impression on you that you know, even in a in a place like Houston, there are some remarkable people who are you know striving to make 
work that's important to them that they want to share with other people. Um, you know, for we, sure. I'm just so proud of all of you. Thank you so much for being friends of the festival throughout the years. And thank you, Katie, for, for allowing us to show your film. I just could not imagine um, it not being in the festival this year. I really could not have imagined. I mean, it's like, we have to show this. Um, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Can I, I say something real quickly, Christian? Yeah, go ahead. I want to thank you because I know you have put your heart and soul into this festival for so many years. And I, I know you didn't found the festival. I know that that was, you know, Sarah Gish and Marianne Luntz and Loris Bradley and Liz Impleton who, who started it 25 years ago. Um, but, you know, when it was called the Houston Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you, you uh, at some point took that project on and, and turned it into Q-Fest and made it, you know, in my opinion, one of the best film festivals that we had to offer um, here in Houston. And it's why I supported it because you guys did such a phenomenal job with uh, your programming and, and just really making it a unique experience for the Houston film community and for the, the film culture, it really enhanced our film culture here in Houston. So thank you for all your many years of work and dedication to this film festival. And I'm sorry that this will be the last year, but uh, you know, take this, you know, take this as, you know, a job well done from having it last this many years. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. I am going to enjoy um, whatever, wherever I go next. It's like, you know, Stephanie and I have been talking about this. I want to move to Italy and I want to do <laughs> things that you can only do in Italy. Like <laughs> enjoy <laughs> life. You can't enjoy life in the U.S. anymore, but in Italy you can still. The Especially Texas. <laughs> Especially. So, I mean, yeah, it's been heartbreaking and um, all of that, but um, I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I was able to have this experience today to have all of you here, even if it's not in person, because normally Katie, we would fly you here, you know, at someone's expense, <laughs> most likely mine, but it would have been worth it. Like, look, this is great. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank, um, our panelists, uh, Mel Peterson, Michelle Mower, Jenny Waldo, Stephanie St. Sanchez, and of course you, Katie McLean. Thank you, thank you, and please. Thank you so um, much for having us. Of course. Yeah, it was wonderful, thank you. It was great meeting you, Katie, and oh, seeing yeah. everybody else. So, so yeah. So Before you. everyone goes, can just as my personal indulgement, because Katie said, like, and she continued, you know, uh, can each of you tell us Give us a little slice of what you're going forward into. What What's the next project? What's the next hurdle for you? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm trying to make an independent narrative film about a female artist and her two lovers. And uh, it's called Paint Made Flesh. And it actually was a play about a male artist and his two female lovers. And I flipped it and uh, it has an LGBTQ uh, element to it um, where we have a surprise about the, about the lovers uh, that comes into play, which is really fun. And um, I just think it's really a great script. So I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get that guy made, you know, it's uh, it's hard work, um, but you know, I really love the story. So. That sounds like a Q fest film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I start. We're gonna production. have to come back, man. We're gonna. That's yeah. <laughs> so I start production Wednesday on another movie. So uh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and I um I've I've got my debut feature film Acid Test uh, premiering at Austin Film Festival next month. Uh, so hopefully that will start rolling some festival stuff. Uh, and I had a a screenplay that got a quarter finalist in the Nickel Fellowship. So. I would love for that to be my second feature. Uh, it's a Baytown based project. Um, so, you know, again, local and all this stuff, but, uh, but yeah, so I'm excited. Jenny, what's the name of the other fest? It's Twin Cities. Film it's film? Twin Cities in Minnesota. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I have great. friends in Minneapolis. So oh yes. Please help. spread the word. The Minneapolis one the, is uh, it's, we're part of their streaming package. So I think it's open to that region. Uh, kind of Minnesota, Wisconsin kind of uh, area, and then Austin's in person. So I'm so excited to see it 
in a theater with people and uh, get their reactions. So oh, it's so great. I want to mention that Paint Made Flesh was a quarter final uh, quarter finalist in the uh, Blue Cat screen. Oh, cool! Yeah. yeah, so very excited about that. I really love Blue Cat. Yeah, so yeah. Shout out to yeah. them. Awesome sauce! Y'all are really getting along there. <laughs> I love it. Stephanie, what are you doing? Um, well, I have a, um, a, uh, <laughs> it's this thing, it's called Queer Bits. It's, um, it's, it's set in the dystopian future. Um, there's Barbies involved. Awesome. <laughs> um, and it's going to be premiering, uh, October 15th at this year's Houston French Festival. Oh, cool. Great. <laughs> and then, um, after that, I'm going to get back to some writing, which is, uh, really hard with the kids you know i'm gonna have to just lock myself yeah. up in the treehouse and uh <laughs> you know i'm still chasing that feature you guys you know it's yeah. always uh it's really hard because I've, I've, my attention span is very short that's you know thank you sesame street thank you mtv that's all i can say to that <laughs> um but uh i feel like uh i want to get that feature out there I wanna get that feature. Yeah. yeah you'll okay. do it you'll do it i yeah, believe in you stephanie string them together yeah can't okay. wait to see queer Barbie bits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this is another um, another uh, side effect of um, of being uh, having kids is they inspire your creative juices. So <laughs> I know for a fact that her daughter has been designing narratives with Barbie. <laughs> so inspiration. But um, as for me, I'm actually, I'm finally getting back into my writing. Like Steph says, sometimes life hits you. And here in Houston, we've had like a major storm every few years now. So it's really impacted the arts communities. So trying to get back to into writing and everything, I've finally written a short film that I'm hoping to turn into a feature. And uh, we're filming it now with uh, resources from the public access. They actually do a workshop called the Filmmakers Project, which is open to producers or anyone in the community, completely free. Uh, you submit your script, and we help you push you through the path of production, right through writing, through shooting it, and then premiering at a local theater venue. So... You know, we're really excited about that. And I actually took advantage for my own self just to get back into the stream of writing. And the next hurdle after that is going to be directing again, because I've taken a bit of a, a break from that. But I I'd, I'd definitely like to jump in to gain features done. Uh, one thing I am proud of with this current project is it stars a older a uh, black woman. It's about Fifth Ward in Houston, and it's set during the freeze that we had here in Houston. So it's kind of a horror movie, socially conscious horror movie that talks about, you know, gentrification and what if, you know, what if monsters were the re were the way they got people killed in minority communities? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it stars an older black woman of the marvelous Vera Lusk, who's a singer, who's one of our producers here, and I love working with her because she's so professional, but also she is so like she was amazed that we took a chance on her because she's like when you're older no one wants to hire you <laughs> and I was like age is a number girl <laughs> I was like I want to see some old black superheroes old black women superheroes out there saving the world <laughs> nice. that's my action film so did you see fast great. color did you, uh, see fast color? did you see fast color I have not seen fast color I saw thunder yeah. force though with Melissa yeah. McCarthy and yeah. Octavia Spencer on Netflix that's a super group you one. definitely got to see fast color it's, yeah, it's, great it's really it's, nice yeah it's it, a great film it's so great it's so great mm -hmm. and uh and actually one of my actresses of the upcoming film was in fast color wasn't that and, okay you gotta yeah. forward me the link I need to yeah. stream that <laughs> yeah it's on Netflix I think but it's it's or one of the streamers it's on yeah. you know you can find it easily but it's okay. so great fast color. and it's oh. multi-generational um yeah. black mm. superheroes that's that's what I'm saying you know it's badass it's like, it's totally badass get and that I, diversity I in front of me like, like, I heard they were developing like a series out of it and I really hope that's true because it was it's you know, it's so well, it was so well done as a feature that I think that it could be expanded into a series for sure. So I hope that mm -hmm. happens. Groovy. Hey, I'd love to do a horror movie franchise, movie franchise, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll be in there together, Michelle. <laughs> 
Thank you all so much. And Katie, I cannot thank you enough. Being an up and coming female filmmaker is hard enough without having the voices of your ancestors and your, you know, your colleagues, your contemporaries help push you along. And uh, I love what you've done. You've done a service to the world, not just the female community, but the world. So. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having the film at the Q Fest. I was so excited. I squeaked really loudly when I got that email. I was like, ah! so I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so happy to be on this panel with all of you. It's just such a, a boost and a bolt of, of great like energy and, and encouragement. And so thank you so much for, uh, for your validation of the film. It means a lot. Thank you. Okay.